And even as uh, speaking of markets, we turn to a very different fictional take on Wall Street in the form of a thriller with a plot line drawn from real life. That's the subject of NewsHour economic pulse, uh, economics correspondent Paul Salmon's conversation. It's part of his ongoing reporting, Making Sense of Financial News. The stocks accelerate their slide down a couple digits right with not every novel gets its own trailer, especially not novels about the world economy. But then again, few novelists have a track record like Robert Harris's. This is what it's like being on the campaign trail with the Prime Minister in 1983. It's as far as After years as a British campaign. journalist, Robert Harris turned to speculative thrillers. So popular, they've consistently reached a mass audience. Fatherland, an HBO movie, Archangel, a BBC miniseries, the prosecutor is and The Ghost, renamed The Ghost Writer when filmed by Roman Polanski. But Harris's latest book, The Fear Index, stars a hedge fund driven by an algorithm run wild. And the more Harris researched its plot, the more plausible it seemed to become. I'd never heard of algorithmic trading. Um, I went to see a hedge fund in London. They showed me a room full of computers. And in the course of the 20 minutes that I watched, this machine made one and a half million dollars without any human intervention. What did you come to understand that these machines were doing? What the machines essentially do is take millions of pairs of uh, data. Um, you know, the pr if the price of copper is here and the German stock exchange is there and the price of oil is here and IBM is there, then tomorrow the price of tin will be here. It's not always right by any means, but they only have to be right 55% of the time, and then they're going to make an awful lot of money. Now, computer trading has been around for years, and stock exchanges have instituted various safeguards to keep it from getting out of hand. But the new game in town is high-frequency trading, with computers and their algorithms moving in and out of stocks as many as tens of thousands of times a day. And what they've done in my book is they've developed an algorithm that can predict the markets by analyzing the incidence of fear-related words on the internet, trends on Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, the sense of a mood. I thought I was making this all up, but of course <laughs> I then discovered that this is yesterday's news. They've been doing this for years. There's nothing you can invent that these guys, very clever, haven't thought of before you. Bloomberg news feeds are digitalized and go straight into the machine and buzzwords are picked out, panic, rumor, fear, slump. And, you know, you just get a few milliseconds maybe advantage if the machine can work out what this news story is going to do to the markets in the next um, few minutes. And that's what your novel gets at, the ability of an algorithm to exploit that anxiety. That we are... Um, the victims of some sort of gigantic H.G. Wells like science fiction creation, which is the markets so huge in the, in the numbers of shares and the vast values of transactions every day, so fast in, with the speed that the, it has somehow slipped the control of human beings and, and almost is itself a kind of Frankenstein's monster run amok in the world. Well, suddenly yeah. it's down 300 more from when I sat down here. On the afternoon of May 6, 2010, reality overtook the fiction Harris had just begun. The Dow, already down 300 points for the day on Greek debt jitters, plunged another 600 points within five minutes. When I ask them what the heck is going on down here, uh, I don't know. There is fear. This is capitulation, really. I mean, it is classic capitulation. There is fear in this market. You can take. And I remember watching that happening live. Uh, and it was that uncanny feeling that your fiction was coming true uh, in front of your eyes because it was very much algorithmic trading that um, caused that flash crash. In the U.S., high-frequency firms represent only 2% of the 20,000 or so trading firms operating today. But they now account for nearly three-quarters of all trades. And the average time a stock investment is held these days is 22 seconds. If time is money, microseconds are now millions. In a recent so-called TED Talk on cutting-edge technology, tech whiz Kevin Slavin wowed the audience by describing buildings now being hollowed out in lower Manhattan. Why? 
so that high-frequency trading firms can move in and get as close as possible to New York's point of entry for the Internet at a so-called carrier hotel in Tribeca. And this is really where the wires come right up into the city. And the further away you are from that, you're a few microseconds behind every time. These guys down on Wall Street, they're eight microseconds behind all these guys going in to the empty buildings being hollowed out up around the Carrier Hotel. Just to give you a sense of what microseconds are, it takes you 500,000 microseconds just to click a mouse. But if you're a Wall Street algorithm and you're five microseconds behind, you're a loser. Who are these people? They don't hire anyone to work who has less than a PhD uh, in the natural sciences or mathematics and that weren't peer-reviewed in the top 15 percent. They don't even want someone to come and work for them who's got a degree in economics. It's too soft. The algorithms are actually the brain children of top-flight physicists, forced to migrate to Wall Street in the early 90s when Congress killed the 54-mile-in-circumference super collider, for which land outside Dallas was already excavated. Now, there are going to be 2,000 scientific posts at uh, this, uh, the Desertron, as they called it. And this coincided, we're talking here of 1993, with um, the rise in Wall Street of computers and of pricing risk and bringing in mathematicians, and hundreds moved into Wall Street. We're talking about the influence of physicists and mathematicians and the speed and power of computers uh, and of the Internet and the web have utterly changed everything. Now, the traditional argument for high-frequency trading is that it promotes liquidity, making it easier for the normal investor because there are so many more big buyers and sellers willing to make trades quickly and cheaply. But many market observers are skeptical. Count Robert Harris among them. We live in an age of great jitteriness in the financial markets, and um, I, there's no doubt it, I'm, at all. I think that it's the volume of um, computer-traded stocks has helped contribute to that. One of the great moments for me in researching the novel was to listen to the audio commentary that was broadcast live from the pit of uh, the Chicago market as the whole market started to collapse. Sixes are trading, four evens, three evens are trading, here, two evens are trading. And you can hear people screaming in the background, and the guy's voice is as if he's seen the monster coming towards him. It's the most extraordinary uh, piece of uh, soundtrack. I think that we've had the most exciting 15 minutes in street science history. <laughs> By the end of the day, the market had recouped the 600 points it lost during the flash crash, but nobody can guarantee that it won't happen again. And that is what is worrying, I think, about this high-frequency trading. We won't know it's disastrous until the disaster has occurred. A disaster like the one imagined in Harris's book or in real life.